Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Voices in Clinical and Translational Sciences series sponsored by the Integrated Translational Health Research Institute of Virginia, or iThrive. Just to remind you, the mission of iThrive is to catalyze and sustain inclusive clinical and translational research through diverse collaborative team science, innovative data science, and broad workforce development in order to improve human health and promote health equity. This new series serves as a platform to lift outstanding researchers and underrepresented voices in research across the iThrive partnership with a focus on promoting dialogue and encouraging team science. The series is aimed at amplifying diverse perspectives in clinical and translational research to foster innovation and an inclusive environment. We will be highlighting some of our amazing iThrive research researchers who will share their research and their lived experience with us. So it's my great pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Nazreen Ibrahim. So Dr. Ibrahim is a faculty member in the Advanced Heart Failure and Transplant Cardiology section at Anova Health and Vascular Institute in Fairfax, Virginia. She received her undergrad and her medical degrees from the University of Cincinnati. Then she did a fellowship in Advanced Heart Failure at the University of Colorado. She then did a second fellowship at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School in cardiovascular research. In her clinical environment, Dr. Ibrahim became acutely aware of the disparities in care and outcomes in black people with heart failure. She has focused her research efforts on clinical biomarkers and clinical trials to reduce heart failure incidence and mortality in black individuals with a special emphasis on young adult black men. Today, Dr. Ibrahim will speak to us on the gatekeepers to heart transplant, who are we keeping out? It's an absolute joy for me to have Dr. Ibrahim join us today. Her passion for clinical care, clinical research, and translation of her research efforts to improve the care of her patients is truly inspiring. She has over 75 publications and is now thinking about how to impact local and national policy to make an even bigger impact. We are excited that she will be continuing her training toward a master's in public health policy through a new fellowship in minority health policy at Harvard, which she will start in this July. She is a leader and a change agent for patients with heart failure and for all people dealing with health inequities. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nazreen Ibrahim. Thank you so much. That's really the best intro anybody's ever done for me. I need to tell my parents about this, but really, thank you. Um, that was very, very nice of you and very kind of you to invite me um, to speak today about something I'm very passionate about, as you mentioned. And um, I was just telling Sandra, you and Sandra have been really instrumental in me um, being clear on my vision and of what I want to do with my life, both academically, personally, and clinically. And I'll share a little bit more about that at the very end. So um, my talk is the gatekeepers to transplant. I won't take the whole hour because I do want time for questions and comments and also any advice you might have on um, how to keep amplifying my message. Um, I have no disclosures related to this talk. Um, and I have three objectives today. I, wanna, I want you to be able to appreciate the history of heart transplant, where we started and how far we have come. I want you to recognize racial, ethnic, and sex disparities in heart transplantation. And then finally, understand the mechanisms of disparities in organ allocation in heart transplant. And really what we know from heart transplant translates very easily to other um, solid organ transplant. Um, so we'll start with where we started and where we are headed. Um, so you all know, I hope you know, the first human heart transplant happened um, in Cape Town, South Africa. This was on December 3rd, 1967. And the physician who gets a lot of press um, and is in all the textbook is Dr. Christian Barnard, but the person we really don't talk about is Hamilton Naki. Um, he was actually a gardener and he worked in the animal lab of the hospital where the first heart transplant was um, performed. And he really taught Dr. Barnard 
almost everything he knew about um, transplant. He was not actually involved in the human heart transplant, but he taught him a lot. Um, he had no access to higher education because, because of apartheid at, apartheid at the time. And this is a quote from him. He says, I stole with my eyes. So he really taught himself everything he knew. And we don't talk about him enough when we talk about transplant. Um, so the first human heart transplant, the donor was a 25-year-old woman. Um, her name was Denise Darval, and she suffered a severe brain injury as a result of a car accident. And the recipient was a 53-year-old man named Louis uh, Waskonski, who had end-stage heart failure from ischemic heart disease, which is uh, more common in men than in women. Um, unfortunately, he died 18 days later from pneumonia. And because this was all so new, um, they thought that the new, brand new heart was rejecting. And so they slammed him with a bunch of immunosuppressive medications, and he ended up getting a pneumonia um, and died. So what about in the United States? The first heart transplant actually happened uh, December 6, 1967. People uh, usually jump to the first one that happened in Stan at Stanford, but it really happened in 1967. And it was a 18-day-old uh, male infant who was the recipient. And he received the heart of a two-day-old um, anencephalic male. And this was um, in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, the first adult human heart transplant in the US happened January 6, 1968. And this was the one by Dr. Norman Shumway at Stanford. Again, um, the recipient was a 54-year-old 54, 54 man, and he received received the heart of a 43-year-old man. Um, the recipient died 15 days later because of multiple, uh, multiple organ failure. So by the 1970s, most of the heart transplant centers really gave up on transplant because they couldn't figure out how to not, uh, how the heart, to make sure that the heart did not reject and um, and so until it wasn't until that cyclosporin was discovered in 1969 that heart transplant really re-emerged and became the gold standard therapy for the treatment of end-stage heart failure. So as you can see here, um, survival was um, pretty dismal until cyclosporin came on the market and became um, one of the best immunosuppressive therapies we had until the arrival of other agents like tacrolimus that we use um, predominantly now, and then MMF or CELSEP mycophenolate mofetil. So the intersection between heart transplant and mechanical circulatory support is interesting and very necessary. So I'll go over a little bit of the history. So the first total artificial heart was performed by Dr. Denton Cooley. This was done in Houston in 1969, and it was done as a bridge to transplant. Uh, and it was done in a 47 year old man. Um, the patient only had this device for three days um, and then he was transplanted, but again, uh, only survived for 32 hours and died uh, because of renal failure and pneumonia. Uh, the first time that a total artificial heart was placed as destination therapy, meaning this was the end all be all, this patient wasn't eligible for whatever reason for a heart transplant. And so the device that this patient would live for for the rest of his life um, was um, at this total artificial heart. So in 1982, Dr. William DeVries, he performed uh, he removed the heart of Dr. Barney Clark. This was um, a dentist. And then he placed the world's first permanent artificial heart at the University of Utah. Um, it was the Jarvik 7, and it was named after the inventor, Dr. Robert Jarvik. Um, the device was connected to a huge um, air compressor, and it accompanied Dr. Clark for the rest of his life. So he only survived 112 days, but this is better. Um, this was better than transplant at the time. And as you can see here, um, this is a, a picture from the University of Utah's website, this huge air compressor. And if you've ever seen or taken care of patients that have um, left ventricular assist devices or LVADs now, uh, their life is very different. They walk around with essentially a fanny pack and not this huge device. So we've really come a long way with um, not just heart transplant, but also device therapy. Um, so just a brief history of left ventricular assist devices. So this, um, you know, the first FDA approval was in 1992. 
And I'm just gonna jump here to the devices that you're going to see right now. The HeartMate 2, um, you know, was around when I was training, but we don't really use it anymore. The FDA first approves these devices as a bridge to transplant. So again, these are patients that are waiting for a transplant. Um, and then they approve them as destination therapy. So again, these are patients that are not eligible for heart transplant because um, when you look at all the data, patients do much better with heart transplant than with um, these pumps. So the next device that came on the market was the Heartware um, LVAD. It was first as a, approved as a BTT and then a destination therapy. And the only device we have on the market right now, which really is not great because when you have only one device, it means nobody's competing to try and make Make an even better device. So the only one we have right now is the HeartMate 3. Um, the hardware was taken off the market. The reason being the HeartMate 3 has been shown to have to cause less strokes um, and less bleeding. So the big three things when you put these, uh, uh, you know, these hunks of metal in these patients ends up being strokes, uh, bleeding, as well as infections. So we only have one device um, right now as an option for patients. Um, so in terms of the global perspective, most heart transplants happen in North America. And as you can see here over the last several decades, um, the number of transplants that we perform every year stays the same, uh, but the number of patients living with heart failure continues to increase. So it's a scarce resources. Um, and lots of work is being done to understand how we can better use um, lots of the hearts that end up being discarded. And I always talk to my trainees about thinking about heart transplant like it's a used car. So you're going to get uh, to the lot and you're, you know, you're looking at a heart or a car uh, that's been used before. Everybody wants the Mercedes, everybody wants the Bentley if you can afford it. Uh, but sometimes we do have to look at the Toyota. Sometimes we do have to look at the Hondas or, um, and decide um, maybe to use those hearts instead of discarding so many hearts and uh, lots of researchers are working on better understanding um, how we can make more use of the hearts that we end up discarding. Um, so uh, you probably have heard about the hepatitis C heart donors. So this was huge a few years ago and it gave certain centers an advantage uh, if they were using hepatitis C donor hearts. And the reason we're able to use hepatitis C donor hearts, because as you're aware, um, hepatitis C is curable now. And as you can see here, this is data from Vanderbilt. They really were one of the pioneers of hepatitis C uh, donor hearts. The survival is essentially the exact same uh, if you were to get a hepatitis C negative heart versus a hepatitis C positive heart. Uh, unfortunately, there's lots of stigma around hepatitis C. Uh, so sometimes patients are still wary um, and decline hepatitis C donors, which puts them at a, at a disadvantage because you really want to accept all sorts of donors to increase your chances of getting transplanted and also so that, so that you're not waiting too long um, on the list. Um, this other cool device, um, we used it when I was at Mass General, but uh, we haven't used it here at Innova yet, but there's talks of bringing it. It's called the Transmedics Organ Care System or Heart in a Box. So essentially what happens is the heart comes out of the donor and you put it on this box that kind of simulates a uh, human physiology and you're able and you use the blood of the recipient. So that's what circulates in this machine. Um, and you can see the heart um, pumping and you get a sense of what the heart would look like once you place it in the recipient. Um, most of the hearts that we put on these uh, pumps or these devices are usable. Uh, and there's been certain instances where um, the heart has come from a donor that had ha had cocaine in their system. And then you were always wary of those hearts because cocaine does horrible things to the heart. So you put the heart on this device and then you see that it's not pumping so well. And so that's why you would discard it. And I've seen it a couple of times with uh, donors that have died uh, with cocaine in their system. But it's a great device because it means we can go further, travel further away, as opposed to using what we have been using for centuries, um, which is, or decades, which is to put the heart, um, again, in a cooler, in ice. So there was an ex the OCS EXPAND trial. Um, these were marginal donors. So again, we're looking at the Toyotas and the Hondas and not the Bentleys. Um, so these marginal donors are really uh, prone to physiologic insults when you put them in these um, ice buckets, essentially. 
Uh, so this was a prospective single arm multi-center trial. Um, and the donor hearts had to meet one of the following characteristics. So either the expected ischemic time was greater than four hours. Four hours is really the number that we look at to say, okay, the distance isn't too far. And you have to think of lots of things. You, you don't just think, well, I'm flying from DC to Boston, for example. You have to think of when I land in Boston, how long is it gonna take me to get to the hospital? So you have to think of all the total distance and you don't want that time for the heart, um, out, the donor heart to be outside the body more than four hours. Um, or the expected total uh, ischemic time was two hours and at least one of the following risk factors. So these are things that we normally look at a donor heart and say, ah, this doesn't look so great. So they had left ventricular hypertrophy, their ejection fraction was lower than what we would like, so 40 to 50%. Um, the donor was down for a long time, greater than 20 minutes, or um, an increased age donor, so a donor older than 55 years. Um, this study had 93 patients, and what they really showed was that the survival was really excellent. So the 30-day survival uh, for the recipients that received these sorts of heart was uh, 95%. Um, and that there was high utility. So 75 of the 93 hearts that they put on this heart in a box um, or 81% were used. So the FDA approved um, this um, heart in a box in 2021. And it will be great if as many centers as possible get comfortable using um, this machine so that you can really expand your donor pool um, for the patients that you're taking care of at your centers. Another thing that has been used to expand the donor pool has been DCD or donation after circulatory death. Um, I did this at the institution I was at before, which was Mass General before I came to Innova. And I think Innova is looking at starting this as well. Um, so the difference here is these donors, um, so what we do traditionally is we, um, the donor is brain dead. And you know, a neurologist and other doctors have said that there's there's no chance of a meaningful recovery, but the donor is still essentially alive, meaning their heart is still pumping, they're on all these drips to keep the heart going, um, and then the surgeons get there, you open up um, the chest and you take the heart um, out. But for a donation after circulatory death, these are patients that have suffered a devastating uh, brain injury, but they don't really meet the criteria for brain death. Um, and what happens is there is a removal of any life-sustaining therapy, and then the donor or the patient is pronounced um, dead within a certain amount of time. It's usually less than 40 minutes. And then the procurement of the heart happens. So once they take the heart out, um, then they put it on um, the heart in a box and they try to revive that heart to see if it becomes transplantable. So um, the issue with this kind of donation is that say you're sitting, you're in Virginia or you're in DC and you're getting a call and there's the hearts in Orlando um, and you have to kind of make an assessment and make a judgment as to whether or not you think that once um, life-sustaining therapy is removed, that the donor, that the heart is going to stop. And sometimes you fly over there, you've used up all this money for this equipment and flights, and you get to Orlando, for example, you withdraw life-sustaining uh, therapy, and then the heart doesn't stop. And so everybody has to turn around and fly back because there's a certain window, usually less than 40 minutes that you, you wait and then the heart stops and then you take it out of the body. So um, this had been happening in Europe. Of course, Europe always does things uh, faster than we do because their version of the FDA is not as strict. So Duke performed the first one in the US in 2019 and Mass General performed the second one um, a few days later. So there's different surgical techniques and the ones that we, the one that we use in the US is that heart in a box or the transmedics um, device that I had mentioned earlier. So there's been concerns about is this ethical or not? So the people against it saying, um, if you are, if you take this heart out of the donor, out of the patient, um, and then you are able to uh, reanimate it, does that mean that, does that really mean that um, this is cardiac death? But the people for it have said, 
well, um, you know, reviving it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean we've reversed um, other things like brain injuries or other organ failure. And then the Institute of Medicine published a report in 2000 saying that the cardiac arrest becomes irreversible within 60 seconds. So there's arguments for and against it, but it is an FDA approved um, uh, organ transplantation method in the US. And they've done that. We use this for heart transplant as well as kidney transplant. So the DCD trial, so this was um, using the heart in a box for DCD arm and arm, uh, sorry, DCD uh, donors. And this was, this was presented recently at the uh, IHHLT meeting. And again, they showed that um, the outcomes were similar, whether or not they used this heart in a box for these DCD donors. So again, just another way, um, another method to increase the donor pool um, with similar outcomes. The newest thing, which I'm sure you saw either on Twitter or in the news, was xenotransplantation. So this was January 7th of this year. Um, this was done at the University of Maryland. Dr. Bartley Griffith performed an operation on 57-year-old uh, David Bennett Sr. And he received a genetically modified pig heart at the University of Maryland. And I just want to point out here that everything experimental we've done um, in heart transplant, even the infants, have been done in male patients. So unfortunately, uh, the patient died after two months um, and it was all over the news as well. And this is just a quote from the New York Times uh, from his son who really says, we hope this story can be the beginning of hope and not the end. We also hope that what we learned from his surgery will benefit future patients and hopefully one day end the organ shortage that costs so many lives each year. Uh, so it's not clear, uh, not totally clear why he wasn't a candidate. There were some things in the, you know, newspapers and on social media about him not being adherent, but I also think adherent um, is a label that ends up disadvantaging a lot of patients. Again, I don't know the patient, I don't know the details, um, but it's not totally clear to me why he wasn't a candidate for a human heart transplant, but we thank him um, for really potentially changing the future um, of heart transplant. So I'm going to cover a little bit about a little bit of the epidemiology of heart failure and really just point out who are the patients that need heart transplant. So um, heart 46% uh, there's going to be a 46% increase in the number of Americans living with heart failure through 2030. And this is really because we've had these amazing medications. Uh, two of them really came on the market in the last couple of years that have improved morbidity and mortality um, in heart failure patients, almost adding about six to seven years of life compared to traditional uh, non-novel therapies. 50% um, of the people that are diagnosed with heart failure will die within five years, and the cost associated with heart failure is enormous. Um, in the U.S., about 65 million adult Americans have heart failure, and every year there's 1 million new cases of heart failure. The prevalence increases with age, um, and this is true for men and women. And heart failure really is a progressive disease. So I always talk to patients about um, this period. So for years, and this period varies from patients from patient to patient. So this can be um, five years, this can be 20 years that patients are living with heart failure, they're, they're working, they're going to school, um, they have no symptoms or on excellent medications. But there comes a time when we start seeing this decline and these increased decompensations or increased emergency department visits and the patients start to go down the slippery slope, uh, which ultimately ends up um, in their demise. And you really want to meet patients um, somewhere here um, and start, this is when you have to recognize that they're not doing so great, that all these, uh, the stability that they had for years is now gone, and that you might want to start talking to them about their options for heart transplant, um, the mechanical heart pumps or the left ventricular assist devices, the LVADs, 
or some patients, um, you may meet them a little too late down the line and you need to talk to them about how can we help you live the remaining years of your life with dignity. Um, one of the worst symptoms is shortness of breath with heart failure and this feeling that people are suffocating or drowning. And so we always have to start these conversations early um, about palliative care and how we can help people live comfortably whatever years of their lives um, they have left. So stage D, so stage A is people that are at risk for heart failure. So these are patients that have diabetes, they might have high blood pressure, they might have a family history. Uh, stage B patients are patients that have a structural abnormality in the heart. So uh, they might have left ventricular hypertrophy. They might have an ejection fraction of 40%, uh, but they only become stage C is if they have signs or symptoms of heart failure. So any patient that has ever been on diuretics and has heart failure is a stage C patient. Um, stage D is mainly the patients that I see. So these are patients that have really exhausted all medical options and all um, you know, CRT devices to, or even valve replacement surgeries to try and make them feel better or live, uh, you know, a better life. And now they have no other options except heart transplant, which is the gold standard treatment um, and LVAD, or um, as I mentioned, palliative care um, or hospice and helping these patients live whatever rears they have left of their life comfortably. Occasionally you meet a stage D patient and they look um, really sick, uh, but they're not really on the best medications and very rarely we can put them on the right medications and get them back to stage C, uh, but that's not usually the case. And the biggest problem that happens here is late referrals. So uh, what I mean by late referrals, so the window for transplant is very narrow. Um, you know, either you're too well and you don't need a transplant now, but you might need it next year or in six months, or you're too sick for transplant. So these are patients that now maybe have multi-organ failure. And while we can do a heart and kidney transplant or a heart and liver transplant, uh, it's very rare to get a triple organ transplant. They are done. They've done them at the University of Chicago and other centers, but these are in much, much younger patients, like patients in their 20s. So this window, uh, once you miss it, um, it, it, it's really and truly tragic. And you see it a lot with, um, you know, cardiologists or other primary care uh, clinicians that are not used to seeing the stage D patients or recognizing when is appropriate to refer for a transplant. Uh, so there's a significant difference in the cumulative hazard of heart failure among racial and ethnic groups. And as you can see here, black patients are significantly more likely to develop heart failure than other racial and ethnic groups. And really they, um, are diagnosed earlier and they present much sicker than other racial and ethnic groups. Uh, what's also different is that heart failure hospitalizations are high for black and Hispanic patients compared to white patients. And the hospitalization rates for black patients are two and a half times higher than for white patients. And every time you get admitted to the hospital, if you remember the graph that I showed you, it's just a sign that you're going down the slippery slope um, and every time you get admitted, it really, um, you know, pushes you back uh, several steps um, in your heart failure journey. What's truly alarming is um, the, the heart failure related death rate. So we'll look first at older adults. So this is 65 to 84 years old. And as you can see here, uh, black men in this age group have the highest heart failure related death rates followed by white men. Um, and then um, the lowest death rates are in white women. But what I'm mo most interested in, and this is where I want to focus on um, impacting policy and other, um, you know, other things that can improve this demographic is young black men. So if you can see here, um, young adults, 35 to 64, black men have the highest heart failure related um, death rates compared to other groups, uh, followed by black women and white men. And then again, white women have the lowest death rate. So why this demographic and this age group is the most alarming is because this is the age group that we see patients and we, uh, we transplant them. So what are we doing here and why aren't we transplanting um, this group of patients that have high heart failure related death rates? Why aren't we providing the gold standard treatment of heart transplant? And if they're not eligible for heart transplant, then why aren't we doing um, LVADs? Um, you can see here, the gap is huge. 
So there has been actually an improvement in LVAD and transplant rates, but it's still below um, what's expected for the disease burden. The disease burden, uh, heart failure disease burden is much higher in black patients compared to the rest um, of the US. And as you can see here, there has been an, an uptake, especially in black men. Um, and the uptake really is because of the Affordable Care Act um, and the expansion of coverage in states that you know, had marginal coverage. And so again, this is how policy directly affects um, heart failure outcomes. What's dismal here, so this is a study I did um, with a group at Yale, and we were just looking at the proportion of Black and Hispanic patients listed and then transplanted. Um, so the, the graph for listed is almost the exact same as the graph for transplanted. So I only put one figure here, and as you can see here, uh, there's a huge gap. And there's always this argument that, okay, well, the population um, of Black patients in America is only 13%. Um, however, uh, the burden of heart failure is much higher in black patients um, than white patients. Um, there's also people doing lots of good work to better understand why black patients have the highest mortality um, after um, heart transplant, especially in the first year after transplant. And it's, you, and it's really just young black patients. So uh, 40 years of age or less um, over here, the blue is non-Black patients, the red is the Black patients. This is more pronounced in the age group 30 years or younger. So this is mortality rates um, after heart transplant. And so um, groups are doing lots of studies, studies and uh, really looking at genomics and understanding whether or not uh, that has something to do um, with the poor survival, one-year survival post-transplant. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll get some data on that in the next couple of years. There's current NIH studies going on to better understand this post-transplant mortality. So how do we decide who gets transplanted? So I will stop sharing for a second because I want to show you a video here. It's a quick video, but just give me one second here. And so this is one of our own. Serena Vasquez is getting a heart. Her donor is an 18 year old boy from Buffalo. The incision time is 9 a.m. There's been a complication in the OR. Serena Vasquez is dead. You can't waste a heart. I go to somebody else in this hospital. Has to be beating by 11 a.m. We need to be prepping someone else by 9 30, the latest. Talk about getting thrown into the fire on your first day. Then sort through the matches, make a decision. Our first patient is Janet Pike. The idea of having someone else's heart in her body is disturbing to her. Yeah, she's still listed. You want Walter to have the heart. Walter has the right disposition. I can reject it again. Send me all out. Third match is Trip Granger. His father's Emmett Granger, Granger Venture Partners. I heard about that heart. I couldn't help but think that God was looking after us. Do we agree to disagree? $25 million, we pick trip, and we're saving much more than one patient. Just got 10 years of my life in this committee. Trying to figure out what a day of life is worth. It's always been about maximizing assets. Unfortunately, the assets are going to be huge audience. Never disclose everything. You're lying about your health. You need to be a success factor. Okay. Let the committee decide that. <laughs> Dr. Taylor, you're the decider. So that's a little, little exaggerated, but I will continue and show you data as to why that's not entirely inaccurate. So uh, back to my slides here. So um, this was really disturbing when I found out about this as a transplant fellow. Um, there was a committee called the God Squad. Um, this was in the 1960s and it was a committee made um, uh, to decide in 1962, the Seattle Artificial Kidney Center, and this committee was, uh, in 1962, seven people were on this committee and they decided 
who would be eligible for dialysis. Um, the seven committee members were anonymous. One was a minister, the other one was a lawyer, there was a businessman, a homemaker, a labor leader, and two physicians. So obviously a whole group of people that not everybody is qualified to weigh in on medical decisions. And they're the ones that decided who would um, go on dialysis and who wouldn't. And disturbingly, they called themselves the God Squad. So what about the heart transplant selection process? So I look, I like to think of it as in three buckets. So there's the medical bucket, which is really the least biased and the easiest to decide. Either the patient is sick enough and they're at the, this right window for transplant or they're too sick. Say it's a patient on ECMO and they have liver failure, kidney failure, they're intubated and debilitated. Um, that's a clear cut, not a candidate for transplant. And then there's the financial piece when we talk about insurance coverage. Um, and there's lots of issues with insurance coverage because the co-payments, like for anything else, vary widely. Um, also with government insurance, so Medicaid, for example, Medicaid in Georgia covers all other organ transplants but does not cover heart transplants. Uh, Medicaid in Nevada does not cover heart transplant. Uh, Medicaid in Montana does not cover LVAD. So there's wide variability with what insurance will cover. Um, and we all know the demographic that's on Medicaid. So in Georgia, 30% uh, of the people on Medicaid are black. And I just told you about black men having the highest mortality rate. So if it's a young black man um, that has end stage heart failure in Georgia and has Medicaid, um, he will be given an LVAD which the, the, line, the life after an LVAD is three to five years uh, average is what we quote patients, but the life after a heart transplant, patients live um, an, a median of 13 years after transplant. Some live less, some live a lot longer than 13 years. So a huge disparity there with insurance coverage. Um, so even patients that do have insurance, the out uh, out-of-pocket costs can be um, anywhere from $200 to quotes that I've seen up to uh, $5,000. For example, if the if the recipient has agreed to do a hepatitis C transplant, because the hepatitis C meds are really, really expensive and some insurance plans um, don't have good coverage for those. So you can see who we're leaving out. These are patients that are from lower socioeconomic status um, that really can't afford hepatitis C donors if their out-of-pocket costs are um, in the thousands range, which I've seen several times. So the other piece where disparities exist is this social piece. So we always tell patients, well, you need somebody to look out for you, uh, look after you after transplant. You know, it's a big surgery. It's not like kidney transplant, but it, it's heart transplant. So thoracic, thoracic organ transplants, you're cracking people's chest open, the recovery is much longer. So you need somebody to take care of you. Um, and then other things that we talk about a lot is substance use. So um, we don't want patients to be using marijuana. We don't want patients to be, on, to be smoking it um, because of the mold and the risk of um, fungal infections in an immunocompromised patient. Uh, but centers have very different rules about maybe, for example, using edibles. And then how do you tell patients that, um, you know, you live in a state like, say, for example, I was I trained in Denver um, where everybody was using marijuana, but we're telling them we're not going to transplant you if we do. And there's not that much data on, um, again, marijuana use and transplant other than smoking marijuana because of the mold. So there is a role for a bias in transplant selection. And Dr. Khadija Brethet, who is my good friend, and she's at Indiana University, and she's really um, a pioneer in this space of understanding how we can better present patients. So I always say, think about it. You're, it's literally feels like a firing squad. There's a patient that's being presented. There's a committee of maybe 20 or 30 people, um, everywhere from surgeons to cardiologists to nutritionists to infectious disease doctors. Um, to social workers. So everybody really weighs in and the decision is a committee decision whether or not a patient is transplantable. So anything said in that committee can really bias the opinion um, of everybody else on the committee. And I always use the example of when I was a fellow um, and we had a patient being presented who really had a very challenging um, upbringing, um, more trauma than I can ever imagine um, a child having really turned his life around, had end-stage heart failure, lived for a while with an LVAD, and now we were listing, wanting to list the patient for transplant, 
And we, you know, almost everybody agreed that yes, this patient, um, he turned his life around and he was a phenomenal patient and followed up in LVAD clinic. And then uh, somebody in the room said, I just want you to know uh, the uncle that said would, he would be his caregiver was released on drug charges 15 years ago from prison, which had nothing to do with the current state um, of the uncle and the patient. But you can just imagine words like that and things said like that about patients really biases everybody in the room. So Dr. Breathitt actually has a huge NIH study right now and in Inova is one of the centers um, to train us to how do we present patients in a less biased way. So her work has shown that black women uh, were the most harshly judged by their appearance and adequacy of social support. Um, there was, however, no association, association between patient gender and race in the final recommendation, but it is possible that biases delay allocation and ultimately inequity in, organ, in the allocation of advanced therapies because of this delay in um, making some, saying somebody is a candidate or not. Um, so I'm going to go over some cases. There's no right or wrong answers, but just to further illustrate how we think about these things and how the current selection system works in the U.S. So um, say you're in clinic and you're meeting a 46-year-old woman. She has end-stage heart failure. Um, she has insurance coverage and affordable deductibles. So again, we've checked those financial, uh, that financial box marks. She's a school teacher and she's a mother of three kids. And she recently moved to Charlotte where your center is after her divorce. Um, so now comes who is gonna be the caregiver. So she has no family in Charlotte and no close friends yet. Her children are too young to be her caregivers. They're all under the age of 15 say. But her church members have volunteered to help and they said they would rotate, uh, they would sign a contract, 10 of them, and they would rotate providing care to her and her kids after transplant. So do we consider community volunteers to be caregivers? Um, because here, when we're thinking about selection in the US and who we consider a caregiver, a lot of times we say, um, is it a spouse? Um, is it a partner? Um, is it a is it you know a child? Is it a parent? Is it an uncle? Is it an aunt? But what about why wouldn't we consider community volunteers as caregivers, especially if you've interviewed them and they've signed a contract saying that they would rotate and provide care? So the second case is a 58 year old man uh, being evaluated for a transplant as well. He is a construction worker and is a husband and father of two adult children. And he has been one of your favorite patients. You've been following him in your program for 10 years, and he's literally done everything you've asked him. But he has no insurance because he's an undocumented immigrant. Um, in a state like Massachusetts, for example, we can uh, provide Medicaid for undocumented immigrants, but other states do not have that option. So now, um, if we do not transplant undocumented immigrants, is it really ethical that we are using the organs of undocumented immigrants when they die and transplanting them in other people? So um, there's not much data on this because nobody likes to talk about uncomfortable things. So from 1988 to 2007, 2.63% um, uh, or 26 um, hundred organs uh, were transplanted by individuals, were received by individuals of unknown or unreported citizenship. Uh, so it's not clear the way we collect data right now, um, the way it's listed um, in UNOS, which collects all the data on transplant, it says non-citizen, non-resident. So that can mean an undocumented patient, but it can also mean these transplant tourists that come from wealthy countries, not necessarily a wealthy country, it could just be a wealthy individual that comes from whatever country and says, I have a million dollars to give your institution if you list me for transplant. So there's no way to tell the difference between um, those two very different patients uh, in the current way the US collects this information, but we do know undocumented uh, patients, undocumented immigrants um, do donate their organs after they die, but we don't give, we don't transplant them in majority of institutions. So the third case is a 50 year old man with end stage heart failure as well being evaluated for transplant. He has insurance, but his out of pocket costs are unaffordable. 
Um, and this is also ridiculous that we do in the US. We ask people to fundraise. And a lot of times, if you are from a low socioeconomic status, you live in a rural community, say you live in a trailer, and I've met patients that live in a trailer and we turn them down for transplant or LVAD because for LVAD, you need a continuous source of electricity. And it's kind of ridiculous in the US that we ask them to fundraise because most of the time, the people in your circle are not going to be the Bill Gates of the world. So um, should so transplant centers perform a certain number of pro bono transplants each year based on volume? And the reason I pose this is because transplant is very lucrative for institutions. So institutions love to do um, heart transplants. And so um, say if an institution does 100 transplants, should they perform two pro bono transplants a year that really will not break the bank, um, but very controversial um, thing to discuss as well. Um, also, can we change health policy so that no one is turned down for transplant based on finances? It took us decades um, to change the narrative on the cost of insulin. So this will probably take decades as well. But I am hopeful um, that this generation of transplant physicians are really outspoken about these disparities. So the final case is a 33 year old man um, that is being evaluated for heart transplant because he has adult congenital heart disease. He has insurance and his out-of-pocket costs are reasonable, uh, but the social worker at the selection committee brings up these con social concerns. Um, he's a smoker and he's tried unsuccessfully to quit on several occasions and also his BMI is 42. So uh, transplant centers have BMI cutoffs. Um, my old institution had a BMI cutoff of 35. The cutoff here at ANOVA is 40 uh, because all the data has shown that the higher BMI, the worse post-transplant outcomes are. Um, and you have to remember, after we put a brand new heart in, we blast these patients with steroids, which ends up making uh, patients gain a ton of weight. So if you start with a BMI of 38, and in this year after transplant, your BMI is al it's almost like 45, um, really it's associated with <coughs> worse outcomes. But are we obligated to provide patients tools to become better candidates? So we don't really arm patients with the necessarily necessary tools to um, quit smoking or to lose weight. It's, you know, we tell them, you know, you need to lose 20 pounds, but you can think of a patient with end stage heart failure who can barely climb, you know, 14 steps or even less than that. Um, and we're asking them to exercise and try to lose 20 pounds without really providing them these intense services um, to try and make them better candidates, because all these things are re really modifiable risk factors. Um, and, you know, we have to be able to provide the tools to make them better candidates. But because transplant is so scarce, it's such a scarce resource, these, or these organs are scarce, and there's so many patients waiting, we really don't in America to take the time to make patients uh, better candidates. So this is the, the journey of a patient through transplant. But they get the referral. Uh, and in my opinion, a lot of times the disparity happens here and who we even refer or who we deem worthy of being referred <coughs> or patients that are in, you know, rural areas of the U.S. that don't really have access to specialized care. And we end up seeing them way too late that they're so sick, we don't even uh, start an evaluation process. So we decide as a team or as a clinician that transplant is medically indicated. Um, we call our financial people, we go over some financial requirements, we give the patients estimates to what we think things are going to cost post transplant. Uh, we go through social requirements and once and finally after you went through all of these um, kind of hard stops, then we decide uh, finally uh, you are transplantable. So how do we move to more a more equitable uh, future, so we really need to improve referrals. Um, we need intentional outreach efforts in communities that are at the highest risk for heart failure related death. Um, these are black and Latinx communities. Uh, there needs to be more education on the importance of being a donor, but also that transplant is incredibly safe. So one of my best friends is a um, heart failure and transplant cardiologist at Boston Medical Center. And if you know anything about Boston, the majority of patients that go to Boston Medical Center um, are, you know, racial and ethnic minority compared to the rest of the institutions in Boston. And there's this belief amongst many of racial and ethnic minority patients that transplant is not 
not good and that transplant is experimental. So just as we, we have all these, you know, donate life campaigns, we really need to go in the same communities and talk about how transplant is incredible, life saving, efficacious, um, and, you know, earn the trust of the communities that we don't deserve the trust of by the things we're doing right now in transplant. Um, insurance expansion, as I mentioned, uh, the Affordable Care Act did tremendous things for uptake of transplant and LVAD, uh, but we really need to look at state policies and understand why Medicaid, for example, in Georgia and uh, Nevada does not cover heart transplant, but covers other organs. Um, we need to talk about cost control. And then we really need to talk about programmatic policies to ensure diversity of patient selection. So if you are a transplant center in Jackson, Mississippi, and you're only transplanting 10% uh, Black patients, we have to understand uh, why that's going on and um, think about policies to put in place to improve um, equitable allocation. Um, so as I mentioned, the Affordable Care Act really helped Black patients, but it didn't make a difference in the uptake in Hispanic or white patients. And what about the role of transplant centers? Well, uh, the example I used about the, you know, the person in the committee saying, hey, well, his uncle was um, released from prison 10 years ago on drug charges. Um, we really need to diversify selection committees. And I don't mean just um, the racial and ethnic um, diversity of the people that are sitting in the room, but also what their experience is. If you've only worked, and I can pick on Mass General because that's where I trained and I worked, uh, Mass General is in one of the wealthiest parts of Boston, so it's in a wealthy white neighborhood. Have you only worked at Mass General for your entire career and really have never taken care of patients that have very different social challenges um, than other patients. So you really need, you need uh, committee members that have taken care of all sorts of patients as well. Um, you need to provide, we need to provide resources to patients to improve their candidacy, whether it's substance use, whether it's weight loss, um, or any other things that other than telling them to go crowdsource and raise money uh, to make them better candidates. And then a programmatic review really to ensure that the demographic of the transplanted uh, patients at an institution match the demographics of the region that they serve. So there has been um, some uh, really some innovative solutions. There's this African American transplant access program at Northwestern. This is one of my very good friends. She's the first Black woman kidney transplant surgeon at uh, in Illinois, in the state of Illinois. Dr. Denise Simpson. She created this um, access program for Black patients, and they work on things like um, cultural humility earning trust. They have health literacy coach uh, and psych providing psychosocial support. And she's been very successful in getting patients um, transplanted that have really been turned down. Uh, one of the examples she told me was there was a patient um, that didn't have a working car, so they were not able to come to the appointments and they were turned down uh, by the committee. And so she ended up figuring out transportation for the patient and she transplanted the patient five years ago. Another similar center, uh, this is at Mount Sinai, and I think uh, their focus here is the Latinx communities in and around New York, and sort of similar to Dr. Denise Simpson's program, it's to improve access, earn the trust, and really address these very, very easily modifiable um, barriers to transplant. So my uh, plans for the future, I'm going to stay at ANOVA as adjunct faculty about 0.2 FTE, but I'm going to Boston, as uh, Dr. Johnston mentioned, to do the Commonwealth Fund Fellowship in Minority Health Policy at Harvard. Uh, but other big news is I'm launching my nonprofit this summer. It's called the Equity and Heart Transplant Project. Um, we're actually having our first organizational board meeting tonight. Um, and the goal of my nonprofit is just finances. So it's very focused um, finances and awareness of the safety of transplant. And I wanna go into black communities um, in and around whatever center I end up working in and talk about how transplant is safe and efficacious. And the other primary goal is finances. So uh, an example is uh, say you're living, at, your transplant center is in DC and your patient lives four hours away. So us as transplant docs, we tell them, well, you have to live within um, you know, a 60 mile radius of DC and we expect the patient 
to air, pay for an Airbnb or an extended stay hotel. So what my nonprofit would do is we give money um, to the institutions or to the Airbnb folks or to the hotel so that the patient uh, is not turned down based only on finances. So far, just myself, without us yet becoming a 501c3, we've raised $5,000 from my book sales. So really excited about the next steps in my career. And um, really, that's it. So remarkable advancements have been made in heart transplant. Disparities still exist. <clears throat> and lots of work remains to dismantle the disparities, but the future is bright. And I really um, want to thank Dr. Karen Johnston and Sandra Burks for this invitation, but also helping me with my first grant that I ended up having to stop because um, I got this fellowship, fellowship at Harvard and I felt so bad. But please know that you really helped me solidify my vision for what I want to do with my life.